Today is Wednesday, March 8th, 2023, and we're here tonight at the Four Lakes Church of Christ in Madison, Wisconsin, to study the book of Genesis. We are back in Genesis tonight in chapter 39, so I want to invite you to take a copy of the scriptures in your own lap tonight so you can have that with you. We'll have the text on the screen if you're joining us on YouTube. I know some of you are joining us on the telephone, so either way, it's good to have our own Bibles out so we can check cross-references and look things up and look at maps in the back of our Bible as we kind of needed to do last week, and so I want to invite you to have a Bible with you tonight as we study. And we also want to invite you to be with us this coming Lord's Day morning at 9.30 for about 45 minutes of Bible study. Of course, it's important to study the Bible on our own, using our own Bibles at home, on our own time, at work, in the car, wherever we are, to listen to Scripture, to pay attention to Scripture. But there is a special value to coming together as a Christian family and uh, sharing ideas, sharing what it means to us, and kind of coming to some clarity, especially concerning how we can apply Scripture to our own lives. So that's at 9.30 this coming Lord's Day morning as we study from the book of Isaiah, and then we'll come back together again at 10.30 as well for worship. And always, if you have any questions about what you see or hear in our class tonight, give me a call or send a text to 608-224-0274. That's the church line. And that goes through to my cell phone. And then also we would invite you to email us at fourlakeschurch at gmail.com or stop by the website. A lot of resources on there, fourlakeschurch.org. There's a contact page on there, a lot of information about the congregation. And if you haven't yet subscribed to our YouTube channel and turned on notifications for that, this would be a great time to do that. We invite you to do that tonight as well. But back to the book of Genesis, the book of beginnings, written by Moses. And uh, we've looked at Adam and Eve and Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. And tonight we are finally back to Joseph. And we'll be with Joseph for the remainder of the book of Genesis. Joseph, of course, is the 11th son of Jacob. And two weeks ago, we learned that Joseph was Jacob's favorite son, with this favoritism being expressed outwardly, of course, with the coat of many colors. Uh, Joseph pretty much tattles on his older stepbrother, so they're not really fans of Joseph at all. He's the tattletale. He's the one getting him in trouble. But then we also learn that Joseph had at least two dreams, and he tells these dreams to his brothers. Remember the first was the uh, dream of the sheaves bowing down to him, like bundles of grain bowing down to him in the field. And uh, the second was of the eleven stars and the sun and the moon bowing down to him, an obvious reference to his parents and his brothers. And in response, just making a long story short, Joseph's brothers beat him up, they put him in a pit, they sell him into slavery in Egypt, and they deceive Jacob into thinking that uh, his favorite son, Joseph, has been killed by a wild animal. And that's where we left it a couple weeks ago. So let's pick up tonight with Genesis 39. Genesis 39, verses 1 through 6. Actually, just the first half of verse 6. So I've got 6a, and then we'll pick up with 6b in the next paragraph. The paragraph kind of breaks right in the middle there. So Genesis 39, verses 1 through 6a. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. <laughs> All right. Somebody closed a car door like two blocks away, and the beagle went off. All right. So uh, Genesis, <laughs> where in the world am I? Genesis 39, 1 through 6. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an Egyptian officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the bodyguard, uh, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had taken him down there. The Lord was with Joseph, so he became a successful man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. Now his master saw that the Lord was with him, and how the Lord caused all that he did to prosper in his hand. So Joseph found favor in his sight, and became his personal servant, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he owned he put in his charge. It came about that from the time he made him overseer in his house and over all that he owned, the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house on account of Joseph. Thus the Lord's blessing was upon all that he owned in the house and in the field. So he left everything he owned in Joseph's charge, and with him there he did not concern himself with anything except the food which he ate. All right, so we're introduced to Joseph down in Egypt now. So he's sold by his brothers to the Ishmaelites who are on their way down there to trade in aromatic gum and balm and myrrh. And when they get down to Egypt, they sell Joseph to Potiphar, the captain of Pharaoh's bodyguard. And as we discussed a couple weeks ago, we might compare this to the head of the Secret Service if we're talking about life here in the United States. So it's a very influential position. Um, high up in the Egyptian government, a lot of uh, responsibility would be tied to this. So this is a man of wisdom. He's a man of experience. And uh, obviously, 
uh, slavery is generally bad, isn't it? it? It's not good to buy and sell human beings, um, whether we're talking about body parts being sold after abortions, or whether we're talking about people being captured in one country and sold to people in another country. Both of those are extremely evil. And uh, however, we also know that in spite of Joseph being sold by his brothers, we find in verse 2 that the Lord was with Joseph. And so he became a very successful man. And I think I've seen that happen today. Uh, not the slavery part of it, but the part where God's people get put in some tough situations, but they work hard. And they live by some very basic biblical principles, including working hard, being honest, conscientious, being nice. Uh, treating people as you would uh, want to be treated, and, and so on. And I've seen this happen, where God has a way of using people who allow themselves to be used by God. It can happen in government. It can happen in business, in the secular world in general. And of course, being beat up, sold into slavery by his brothers, purchased in Egypt, being put in this man's house as a slave, I mean, obviously, Joseph could have sulked, he could have been angry, he could have just slacked off, he could have refused to work, uh, but instead, this young man gets to work. And as a result, by the time we get down to verse 3, Joseph, with God's help, sets himself apart. And it very quickly becomes obvious to Potiphar, as a leader, as a man of experience, that the Lord is with this guy. Something is different about this young man. And Joseph's success is clearly the result of God's blessing. And here, this is coming from an Egyptian. And they're pagan. They, they worship idols and that down there. So Joseph, therefore, gets promoted. And he moves his way up in the household very quickly, becoming the overseer in Potiphar's house. He is the manager. He is the one looking over the others. I've done quite a bit of visiting in a number of prisons around Wisconsin and many years ago at least I remember one guy I was visiting getting really excited that he had been made a trustee as I remember it he started out in the kitchen in the county jail I think this was in the county jail down in Rock County actually and uh, he worked hard he had a good attitude for the time that he was there and he very quickly moved up to the point where he was made a manager well, the difference is the guy I was visiting absolutely deserved to be there. He belonged there. He had done some terrible things. And, uh, I mean, it was an honor to be able to visit him and encourage him and help him through that time in his life. But he deserved to be there. Um, but he did the best that he could to work hard, to stay out of trouble, and treat others the way he would want to be treated and that. And, and I believe God blessed him for that. And that's what happens with Joseph in this passage. Only, of course, Joseph uh, in no way deserves to be enslaved. But nevertheless, God very clearly blesses this young man down in Egypt. He's far away from home, taken away from his family and his younger brother. And not only, though, does God bless Joseph, but notice God also blesses Potiphar's house because of Joseph. So the blessing is contagious. <laughs> In verse 5, and, and it gets to the point in verse 6 that Potiphar basically just turns it all over. He just gives everything to Joseph. You're a good manager here. You, you deal with this. And uh, the one exception, of course, is the food that he eats. As I remember it, the Egyptians were really uptight about their food for some reason. And we'll get back to this later in the book. And I don't know if it's because they thought it would be poisoned or if because foreigners were unclean and they didn't want them touching their food. I'm not exactly sure. I don't remember that. I'll have to look into that before uh, we get back to this. Uh, but they were extremely concerned that foreigners not mess with their food. So everything but the food itself is put under Joseph's control, which is a lot. That It's a huge house. So let's continue tonight with Genesis 39, verse 6b through verse 12. So Genesis 39, the second half of verse 6 down through verse 12. Now Joseph was handsome in form and appearance. It came about after these events that his master's wife looked with desire at Joseph, and she said, Lie with me. But he refused and said to his master's wife, Behold, with me here, my master does not concern himself with anything in the house, and he has put all that he owns in my charge. There is no one greater in this house than I. And he has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do this great evil and sin against God? As she spoke to Joseph day after day, he did not listen to her to lie beside her or be with her. Now it happened one day that he went into the house to do his work, and none of the men of the household was there inside. 
she caught him by his garment, saying, Lie with me. And he left his garment in her hand and fled and went outside. Starting in the middle of verse 6, we have this brief little blurb about Joseph being handsome in form and appearance. So not only is this young man a hard worker, not only is he blessed by God in everything that he does, but he's also handsome in every way. And this is where Joseph faces his first real temptation. And here he is, far away from home, disowned by his brother, sold into slavery. And Potiphar's wife looks at him with desire. And then she orders him, lie with me. And I hope we notice this is not a request, is it? This is not flirting. This is a direct command. Maybe one of the first examples of you know, sexual harassment in the workplace. I mean, this is coming from the master's wife to a slave, from a position of authority to someone who has no power in this relationship. But even under those circumstances, I hope we notice that Joseph refuses. And he's incredibly nice about it, isn't he? And he doesn't retaliate at this point, doesn't hit her, you know, nothing like that. But he explains to this woman, Potiphar, your husband put me in charge of everything. He trusts me in every way. And, um, and I can't lie with you. I mean, for that reason alone. But also, if I were to do this, I would be sinning against God. So I'd be sinning against Potiphar, but I'd also be sinning against God. And as we move through this paragraph, we'll find this is not a one-time proposition, isn't it? He, he doesn't deal with this just once, but this is over and over and over again, day by day, day after day. And Joseph continues to refuse. And this is amazing for such a young man far away from home, uh, but he doesn't listen. He refuses to lie with this woman. And I think it's important that we understand both of those. He doesn't mull it over. He doesn't rationalize. But he also doesn't give in in any way. He's very tough mentally. And this had to be incredibly difficult. It would have been so easy to give in here. He could very easily rationalize, well, you know, this woman's my boss's wife. I have to. You know, somebody says... I, I can't be at worship on Sunday. I have to do this thing over here. Really? Do we really have to do these things that we think we have to do? Joseph had to, but he didn't have to, did he? Uh, from a worldly standpoint, he had to, but from God's point of view, he had no choice in this, so he does not give in uh, to this woman. Um, and in fact, she could harm him for refusing, couldn't she? Uh, Joseph was taking a huge risk by not giving in. Uh, but Joseph is incredibly firm with his refusal. Um, however, when we get to verse 11, we find that Mrs. Potiphar waits for the perfect opportunity. She waits until Joseph is the only one in the house. Now, right there is a dangerous position to be in. Of course, Joseph probably had no choice in that. But I think we can learn from this today that a lot of times we do have choices as to who we spend time with alone. And uh, it's a very dangerous thing to be with somebody else in that and those circumstances. But anyway, he doesn't have a choice here. She waits until he's the only one there, catches Joseph by his clothing, uh, demands that he lie with her, but Joseph makes a run for it, even leaving that garment behind. And he runs outside. So, I mean, that's about all he can do. He does the best that he can. He knows he's not doing that and uh, does the best that he can to get away. So she's got all the power here. All he can do is make a run for it, which he does. So let's continue with Genesis 39, verses 13 through 18. Genesis 39, verses 13 through 18. When she saw that he had left his garment in her hand and had fled outside, she called to the men of her household and said to them, See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. He came in to me to lie with me, and I screamed. When he heard that I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled and went outside. So she left his garment beside her until his master came home. Then she spoke to him with these words, The Hebrew slave whom you brought to us came into me to make sport of me. And as I raised my voice and screamed, he left his garment beside me and fled outside. In verse 13, when she realizes she's not getting her way here, she calculates and she weighs her options and she decides to call out to the men of the household. They come in and she makes up this story. But I want us to notice something that I don't think that I've noticed before. She talks to these other men in the house. 
Who does she blame? Who does she blame for what happens here? If I'm reading this correctly, if I'm understanding this properly, she blames her husband, doesn't she? Isn't that what she says in verse 13? See, he has brought in a Hebrew to us to make sport of us. Notice it's not making sport of me. She's talking to the men of the house. My husband, Potiphar, brought this guy in to make sport of us. So think about what she's doing here with that statement. A number of things going on here. Remember, these men had been bypassed by Joseph as Potiphar had put him in a leadership position over them. And so she seems to be putting the other servants against her husband who clearly had a preference for Joseph. So it seems what she's doing here is getting these other servants on her side and lining them up against Potiphar using Joseph to do it. And she will need their support to pretty much confirm the lie that she's about to tell. And notice at the end of verse 14, she says that Joseph came in to lie with her and she screamed. Did these guys hear a scream? No, because she didn't scream. They heard her call out for them at the beginning of verse 14. So it's not like she was out of earshot. They, they heard that call, but they definitely didn't hear any scream coming previously. And that's why she needs these men to be ready to verify her side of the story when she finally talks to her husband. And her side is that after she screamed, Joseph left his garment beside her and fled outside. Well, let's also notice she leaves the garment right there beside her until her husband comes home. Well, that's pretty messed up, isn't it? She wants this story to have the biggest possible impact. And this is the scene of the crime. Here it is. And Potiphar finally does come home, and then she repeats this story to him. Now, if you're one of the most powerful and influential men in Egypt, which is basically the world's lone superpower at this point, what might you do to a slave who's been accused of trying to rape your wife? What would your reaction be? I know what my reaction would be. Think about what your reaction would be, and let's see if that's what happens next. Let's conclude tonight with Genesis 39, verses 19 through 23. Genesis 39, 19 through 23. Now when his master heard the words of his wife, which she spoke to him, saying, This is what your slave did to me. His anger burned. So Joseph's master took him and put him into the jail, the place where the king's prisoners were confined, and he was there in the jail. But the Lord was with Joseph and extended kindness to him and gave him favor in the sight of the chief jailer. The chief jailer committed to Joseph's charge all the prisoners who were in the jail so that whatever was done there, he was responsible for it. The chief jailer did not supervise anything under Joseph's charge because the Lord was with him, and whatever he did, the Lord made to prosper. Well, let's notice Potiphar, he's mad, isn't he? This guy's angry. But notice the text doesn't specifically tell us that Potiphar was angry with Joseph. Yeah, he puts Joseph in jail. But is that what you would have done? That's not what I would have done if I'd been in Potiphar's situation here. But that's how Potiphar responds. So we should probably ask, why doesn't Potiphar have Joseph executed? Isn't that the natural thing? I mean, if, if this happens and you're in that position of power, I think an execution would be uh, kind of on short order here. So why not? Is there a chance that Potiphar trusts Joseph more than he trusts his own wife? Has this happened before? What happened to the guy who was in charge before Joseph? Have we thought about that? You know, maybe he's seen this. I mean, who knows? But we do know that anybody serving as the head of Pharaoh's bodyguard has probably seen some things in his life. He's probably a pretty wise man. He's probably had a lot of um, experience interviewing suspects. All right, this guy is probably the closest thing there is to a human lie detector. And instead of having Joseph executed, he throws him in jail. And this jail doesn't seem to be where the average bad guy might go, but this is where the king's prisoners were confined. And I don't know about to you, but to me, this seems more political. This is perhaps the kind of place where you go when you have a really good attorney. Where you've done something bad, but you've got good representation or you've got a lot of money. You don't go to the average prison. Uh, I once had a guard tell me 
um, out at the uh, maximum security section of Mendota here in Madison. Um, I mean, it is extremely secure, but it is not your average prison. And the card was telling me, if you've got a good attorney, this is where you end up. You may have done some terrible, terrible thing, but if you've got good, if you can defend yourself, you go here instead of some of the other places. And so I would just indicate that seems to be what happens with Joseph. He is jailed, uh, not in the common prison, but he is jailed alongside the king's prisoners. However, we also find in this passage that God continues to bless Joseph, doesn't he? The Lord is kind. The Lord allows Joseph to find favor in the sight of the chief jailer. And Joseph is once again very quickly promoted, isn't he? Right up to the top. I mean, ending up in charge of the entire jail, uh, just as he had been in charge of Potiphar's house. Uh, in fact, anything that happened there, Joseph was responsible for it. Whatever he did, the Lord causes it to prosper. Well, this brings us to the end of our study tonight. We've seen God bless Joseph over and over and over again. Uh, everybody seems intent on trying to bring him down, but Joseph does what's right, and God simply has a way of taking care of it and getting him through it. And that's not a bad lesson for us to learn, is it? I mean, if we kind of back away slowly, look over the, the whole of Genesis 39, that's a good lesson, that God has a way of taking care of those um, who are conscientious, those who live by some biblical principles. Bad things may happen, uh, but God will ultimately work it out in the end. And then I would also ask as we end tonight, how might Joseph's life have been different if he had given in to that temptation that he faced in tonight's chapter? How might this chapter have ended if Joseph had simply said, well, sure, nobody's around, nobody's going to see me. How might this chapter have ended differently? As a handsome 17-year-old young man, he could have very easily given in to this. But the book of Genesis could have also ended right here. But thankfully, though, Joseph finds the way of escape that God provided, and he takes it. So next week in Genesis 40, we get back to Joseph, and I want to thank you again for taking the time to be with us tonight. I hope to see most of you in person this coming Lord's Day at 930 as we get back to our study of Isaiah. And then after class, we plan on coming together at 1030 for the worship assembly. But let's close tonight by going to God in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we are so thankful that you saw it in your mind and in your wisdom to take care of Joseph as you did, blessing him over and over again, even when his life was so difficult. And Father, we're thankful for your care in our lives as well, and we pray that we would react to temptation just as Joseph did. When we're tempted to sin, we pray that we would be able to find the way of escape, but we also pray for the courage to take that path. Thank you, Father, for Jesus. We come to you in his name. Amen.